In this video, we're going to talk about visualizing data using graphs. We're going to start with a very brief discussion of why this is important and useful for us, and then we're going to get into some specific types of data visualization, some very commonly used ones, and some of the strengths and weaknesses of each. So, data visualization is important for at least two reasons. First of all, if you're a data scientist or a researcher or really just anyone in any career who's trying to understand some data better, data visualization is the best way to see what's going on in your data. Just as one example, it's a really powerful way of identifying things like outliers and extreme values. Data visualization is also really important for communicating information about your data and your results to other people, which in my opinion is what statistics is really all about. So we've seen lots of examples already of data visualization helping us to better understand things. Uh, as one example, data visualization can help you see whether your data are normally distributed, symmetrical, bell, bell curve shaped, all of that, or whether they're skewed. This is an example of uh, right skewed, positively skewed data, and here we have negatively skewed or left skewed data. It's also a great way of seeing whether your data are clustered together and or very spread out, as we're seeing here on the bottom. Uh, these two data sets, by the way, have the same mean, so just knowing the mean alone wouldn't really help you uh, to figure that out. And another example of that we saw when we were looking at different depression medications, visualizing the data helped us to determine that this medication was very inconsistent, whereas this was very consistent. And as one last example, it's a great way, you know, when you're graphing your data to see whether your data are evenly distributed or whether there's a lot of clustering and just a couple outliers. So it's really powerful for us to fully understand and make use of when understanding our own data and communicating that data to others. So now let's get into some specific types of data visualizations and the strengths and weaknesses of each. In addition to strengths and weaknesses, I'm also going to tell you which scales of measurement are appropriate for that type of data visualization using three different symbols that I basically took from a statistical software I commonly use to analyze my own data. So here's what I'm going to use for nominal data, ordinal, and interval ratio. And I'm kind of grouping interval ratio here because uh, it's basically the same for the sorts of implications that these scales of measurements have on what analyses you can do and what types of graphs are appropriate. So let's start with the humble pie chart. This is uh, an example of a pie chart. This is real data from two stats courses I taught last quarter, where I asked students on the first day of class how challenging they think the course will be. So you can see that the majority of people said neutral. Uh, a good proportion of people, 39%, said difficult, difficult, lemon difficult. And only a tiny sliver of people, 2.6%, said the course would be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. These were actually the options that I chose for my survey. It tells you a little bit about me. So some strengths of this pie chart in general is that they're pretty simple to understand and they're also visually appealing. There's a lot of colors. People like looking at pie charts. But in my opinion, a key limitation of the pie chart is that it communicates relatively little information. It's only telling you the percentage of people in each category. It's only telling you frequency information, how frequent, how common something is or some response is. So if that's all you want to communicate, great, but if you want to tell somebody anything more than that, you're going to have to use something else. Pie charts are appropriate for nominal and ordinal data. It has to be different categories of things. It's not really appropriate for interval or ratio continuous data. So next we're going to talk about the bar graph, and you're going to see the bar graph actually has the same strengths and weaknesses as the pie chart, and it's also appropriate for the same types of data, the same scales of measurement here. So bar graphs are nice because, you know, again, visually appealing. The height of the bar tells you something very clearly. This is an example of how many participants in my data set are from each of these different regions, each of these different categories on the x-axis. And if that's all I want to tell you, perfect. Bar graph is a great way to do it. If I want to tell you something more, again, I'm going to have to use something else. And this brings us to the histogram, sort of bar graphs. Uh, cousin, a very commonly used data visualization. And I have to mention two things about the histogram. So first of all, for a histogram, you'll notice that the bars are touching, whereas in a bar graph, the bars were not touching. And this is important theoretically. In a histogram, we have an x-axis where we're looking at continuous data here, interval ratio data for the first time. So it makes sense that the bars are touching, they flow into one another because this is a continuous variable. For a bar graph, the x-axis was separate distinct categories, so it made more sense to have the bars separate. Another thing I'll mention about histograms is that these 
bars here contained bins. They're binned values, which means in this bar, it ranges from 20 to 30. This means in this bar, I might have, uh, for example, 21, 26, 28, 28, and 29. And there's five things total in the bar that fall within this range. And that's important to know too. So in terms of strengths, I think the histogram is simple-ish, right? It's pretty simple to understand. Most people get it, but I did have to tell you a thing or two about it that you probably wouldn't know automatically just by looking at it. I would also say it's visually appealing, but again, it communicates little, just frequency information, how many are within each bin. But we also have this benefit for the first time so far of being able to graph interval or ratio scale data. It's not appropriate for nominal or ordinal scale data. And this brings us to one of my personal favorites, the box plot. The box plot is one that requires a little bit more expertise. You're going to see on the next slide, that's really the main sort of limitation of the box plot. But the main advantage of the box plot is that it contains so much information. So let me break that down for you. Uh, this dot here is an outlier. Uh, automatically, when you do a box plot, uh, any dots that are not contained within the box or its whiskers uh, are going to be outliers. So it's a great way of just immediately identifying that. So your outlier is also, in this case, your maximum value. This here is your maximum value without that outlier, if you were to sort of exclude it altogether. In this box here, the middle of the box is your median. So you automatically have an idea of where the center of your data is. This is your minimum value. And again, if we had an outlier below it, that would actually be your minimum value. And box plots are great because you also get information about what's called quartiles. This is kind of like a percentile, but it's at a specific point. So this is your upper quartile. And I'm going to kind of put 75% next to it because the idea is that this is sort of your 75th percentile, meaning 75% of the data is below this point. This is your lower quartile. And as you can see, it is the 25th percentile. So this means that 25% of the data is below this point. So this is a real strength of the box plot. It communicates so much information. All of that is contained in this one neat little plot. You can get information about central tendency as well as variability by seeing how spread out or close together the box and its whiskers are. But again, this requires expertise. If you had never learned about box plots before, you would probably have little to no idea about what you're really looking at if I were to present this to you. And again, this is appropriate for interval ratio scale data, not nominal and not ordinal. So far, though, we've only looked at how we can graph one variable in isolation. But oftentimes when we're doing research or we're trying to understand some data, we really want to look at how two variables relate to one another. So let's look at some examples of how we can do that. First, we're going to take this idea of the box plot that we just saw, and we're going to basically introduce a second variable. So here's SAT math scores on the y-axis. That's what you're seeing for each box plot and region on the x-axis. So we can look at how people tend to score on SAT math on the basis of what region they're from. So here we're looking at a discrete x-axis, meaning nominal or ordinal. This is separate categories of things here. And then we're looking at a continuous y-axis, an interval ratio y-axis. So if you have these types of data, this graph is very appropriate. And this communicates lots of information. We can take, for example, scores in the Midwest, and we can compare that to scores uh, in New England, let's say. So what do you notice about these two box plots? Well, you can see, first of all, that the Midwest is a much bigger plot, meaning scores are much more variable than in New England. In New England, people tend to score very similarly to one another. But you can see that the medians are different. The median here for New England is much lower than the median SAT math score for people in the Midwest. So there's a difference in both variability and central tendency, and you can see that in this multiple box plot here. Next, we have the line graph. Line graphs are great for showing trends over time. So you can see here that as people tend to age, right, as age increases, weight in pounds tends to increase as well. And this makes a lot of sense because we're looking at adolescents here, and you would expect that as adolescents grow and they get taller, they're going to weigh more as well. So this is great for uh, discrete data on your x-axis and, again, continuous data on your y-axis. So nominal or non the x and interval ratio for the y. 
Now, you might be wondering, isn't age a sort of you know, interval ratio variable? You can be zero years old and you can continue on from there. Uh, you're absolutely right. That's a great observation if you were thinking that. Uh, however, I'm treating age here as ordinal. So I'm treating these as separate categories. You're either 15 or you're 16 or you're 17, and we're not looking at anything in between. And these are basically just separate categories. So you can imagine me actually writing out 16, for example, in words, and that's you know in my data set. But, uh, but again, this is a line graph, and it communicates one idea very simply and very clearly. So let's talk about one more type of graph here. So this is the scatter plot. We're going to see a lot more of this moving forward. In our very next video, for example, we're going to talk about correlations. And the scatter plot is the best way to represent correlational data. The relationship between a continuous or interval ratio x variable and a continuous or interval ratio y variable. Scatter plots are powerful because you get to see the entirety of the data set. All the data is contained right here. Each point, each value represents a single participant in your data set. So over here we can see that this child was 70 inches tall and they weighed about, let's say, 170 pounds. As one example, you can see a line of best fit. You've probably seen this before on top of a scatter plot. This is just a simple line that depicts where the data tend to be. It describes the nature of the relationship between the two variables very nicely. You might not have a linear relationship, though, and you might instead fit a curve to the data. And you can fit all sorts of curves and polynomials as you get more advanced. Maybe your data don't follow this linear trend. Maybe they do something like this, and you can fit something like that to the data to help you visualize and sort of quantify what that relationship really looks like. And finally, you can fit an ellipse in the data, on top of the data, I should say, where you're covering, for example, 90% of the data or 50% or 99% of the data. It's entirely up to you, and many softwares have this option. But it's a great way to see where abnormal results are. So we can see that these three participants are not within the ellipse that covers the majority of the data. So we might want to investigate them further to see how they're different than the rest. And this is the power of data visualization, investigating and fully understanding what your data are doing.